doomed, which is a fairly bloody perspective to have. Um, the human race can be saved if governments work together. Climate change is a natural process that will resolve itself, and technology is the answer. It, it might resolve itself in ways which we are not very happy about. <laughs> but at the same time, I think technology, as it's evolving, could play a massive role in helping us in fight against climate change. The thing is, if you look at uh, the, uh, the Arctic and the polar ice is starting to melt, it's having an effect on the polar bears, so you can already see that it's coming into effect. And the polar bears have been affected and the numbers have been decreased. And as the ice is melting, it's coming into the ocean and it's mixing with other sea levels. And that could have an effect as it can cause floods and the human race can possibly be affected by it because of extreme flooding and changes in the, the temperature or the weather being different as well. So, um, I mean, if we carry on the way we are going and we're not looking at changing, then that is a possibility that can happen and not really in a long time either. I'm based at the Lutzen campus. In our canteen there are no fully vegan options. Okay. No say like um, almond milk for example. Yeah. So plant based products. For people who are vegan it's difficult to get food at college and even so they'll probably have to bring their own in. So have you raised that with the comment? I was raised it was a point given to me by friend of mine right. who said there's not a lot of vegan options but this can benefit in the fight against climate change even if we limit our meat intake say for example we could have I think it's called meat plus Mondays mm. but we just don't eat meat we could just gradually decrease that that can have an effect on it. I personally drive buses on a daily basis and right. I believe because buses are being, uh, getting late it's is making passengers think, should I take the bus or should I personally buy myself a car? Because nowadays you can pick up a, a, a petrol or diesel car for about a thousand pounds, the cheapest, yeah. and that can get you through about a year or two. And passengers, what I find is, they choose to, to use that option instead of using the buses, and I feel like the government is the only way to fix that, by creating more bus lanes and stopping cars from getting into it to prevent buses from being late, therefore that means we have more passengers and it's a greener place as well, meaning less cars on the road and less traffic as well. We can't do it on our own, we can't save the planet on our own. Uh, and governments have to act a bit like, you know, during the, the beginning of the Second World War they had to change car factories into plane factories and so on. We've got to get more action into it. And it's, it's a big crisis, we can't do it on our own. The idea of the carbon footprint was, was invented by the oil industry. So we all took on the responsibility ourselves, and we're so into ourselves as individuals and our freedom and stuff, we don't see the we, we don't see the collective so we well We need to anymore. work together, that's it, we need to work together, we need to put things aside and just say, come on, let's do this, let's all work together to fight like that. And that's what government's for, to help us work together. 240, at least 240 species of bee in this country, pollinators. We've got about 270 species of hoverfly pollinators. We've got 9,000 species of wasps. They're not all pollinators, but a lot of them feed on aphids, yeah. which is which is it's another thing. But global warming is producing more and more aphids, which is pretty disastrous for our, for our food supply. But they're all declining. Everything is declining, and we cannot live without nature. But nature can live without us. Yeah. The electric car thing. Is, um, needs to come from the top and it's not doing it. I lived in Holland for quite a while and over there, right now, you can just have a short 50 metre street and there's already 10 electrical charge points on a small 50 metre street. Here, yeah. you have to drive several miles and you probably could be out of the order and get to that one. Yeah. The thing that I think unique about climate change is it affects everybody in the whole world. You know, you can't get away from it. And, you know, in this country, we will be much better if we become insulated from the outcome of that than if you live in Bangladesh or Bangladesh. Exactly. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, and, and so,
that kind of country. Like in that country is uh, like an agricultural based country and it's uh, like a really developing country. Mm -hmm. The fishermen and the who work in the field, the farmers, yeah. who are the main source of yeah. the income in our country. But because of the climate change, the water is becoming more acidic. And the fish are just, just the dead fish. Who can't eat the dead fish or is just destroying the country. I started off my career working in Parliament with climate activists, um, and then also with the IPCC before that, so I've been doing this quite a while. Um, and there were two Bengali citizen representatives. What we did, we did a global lottery um, based on um, population density, selected 100 places around the world. We set, sent community activists um, into those places, and we got 100 people, and we segmented it to be an accurate representation of the global population by income, by views on climate, by gender, by age, etc., etc. And so we've created a kind of a, a world parliament, if you like, and they've been debating and discussing these issues, a little bit like this, except it's been not some people who are all interested in climate, it's been an, an accurate representation of the global population. If you want to run some in Rochdale, you can download the, the Community Assemblies Kit and run it now, so that's happening around the world. But the reason we're doing it, it is very much inspired by like, that Gandhian idea of trying to build deep connection between people, such as the people in Bangladesh or India or China and people in this country, I don't have answers here, but I just think the more we can connect as humans and share our real deep um, hopes and fears about the reality of what we're facing and really respect the legitimacy of our, our perspective, the better hope we've got. Uh, you know, I thought it was a really good debate. I thought a lot of interesting things were said and it was clear there was quite a lot of different lived experience kind of uh, within the group. Um, I think my main takeaway, what I found most interesting actually, was that when it was the discussion of youth engagement with climate activism and youth engagement with kind of the issues that are facing us, actually, it was some of the older members of the debate who were really saying, you know, youth are pushing this forward, youth are doing these things, but actually the younger members themselves were saying they didn't think that um, much of the youth was actually educated and engaged and kind of really interested in making this change. So I thought that was just a really interesting takeaway for me, kind of looking at those different um, things and seeing how different lived experience and life experience can really play a role in someone's belief and, and belief about both the issues but also belief about the action that's kind of needed to go forwards. My name's Andy, um, I've just been party to this two hours of discussion. Always uh, really interesting to hear what other people have to say about this subject and how best to address the whole issue of climate change and especially to hear what some of the younger people here today said which uh, reassured me in a way and made me feel as if uh, you know, there was a, a kind of shared approach to this issue emerging. So um, you know, let, let's see more of these happening and encourage lots and lots more people to have similar kinds of conversations to try and reach a, a shared view as to the best way forward.